do you need to, to complete the semester well? Uh, Dr. Curry is going to be preaching this morning, continuing our, our series, uh, focused on the question from Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him? Uh, looking broadly at issues of the doctrine of, of humanity, uh, Tyler Ivey, one of our graduating students, will be assisting in, in worship as well. Uh, just a couple of brief reminders, uh, nothing, nothing new here. We do have uh, a number of John Colquhoun's uh, book, uh, The Law and the Gospel, still available for any of you students who haven't picked one up in the Dean of Students office. You can drop by and you'll find them in, in the uh, center room there in the Dean of Students office if you haven't received a copy. That's thanks to Reformation Heritage Books. They have uh, uh, sent those to us for you. So pick up a copy if you haven't uh, picked one up yet. Um, also, just a, another reminder that the Banner of Truth uh, East Coast Ministers Conference is May 28th through 30th. They've also graciously provided uh, 10 free scholarships, full scholarships for, uh, for students. Uh, and if you would be interested in going, we've had a number of students go in the past years have greatly benefited from that. I think I've mentioned Tyler Ivey being uh, one of those. Uh, you can ask him about that conference, and it's completely free if you would like to attend. They, they also uh, pay for housing and food uh, while you're there, as well as the cost of the conference. And you can email me if you're interested, uh, and I have a discount code. I think we've used about half of the 10 scholarships. There's still a number of them uh, interested, the, the, uh, available. The, the focus also is on the doctrine of man. A uh, number of speakers will be um, at that conference, including our own Dr. Garner. So if you're interested, you can get in touch with me. All right, if you'll grab your uh, order of, of worship, you'll see our call to worship is from the conclusion of Psalm uh, 24. You may remember that prior to these verses, David asked the all-important question, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? And the answer David provides is he who has clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, not uh, you and I, but the Lord Jesus uh, has ascended. He has entered the holy place. He stands in the presence of God, his Father, even seated at his right hand that he might make intercession for you and me so that we can read together these words with great joy and confidence. So let's stand together and I'll read for us these concluding verses of Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we uh, know what David uh, could not see clearly, that this psalm anticipates you. Uh, you as the king in all of your glory and through you, uh, we come not to an earthly temple made by man, not to an earthly city, but the true Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable, innumerable angels gathered, uh, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to you as the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, oh, that we may be counted among that number uh, by your grace and for your glory, we pray. Amen. If you'll remain standing and take your Trinity hymnal, we'll sing together hymn number 286. Conquered death and 
please remain standing. Well, our theme this semester is the doctrine of man, and let's see how the Westminster Shorter Catechism plays into Dr. Curry's sermon this morning on walking in the new men. I will read the question, you will respond with the answer. Question 18, wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell? Question 19, what is the misery of that estate wherein to man fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so may be liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Question 20, did God leave all mankind to perish in that estate? Of sin and misery. God having out of his near good pleasure from all eternity, elected his son to everlasting life, he entered into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery, and to bring them into a state of salvation by the Redeemer. You may be seated. Our scripture reading will be found in Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In response to God's word, let's confess our sin and our need for his mercy. We will read this together. O Lord, Lord, have have mercy mercy upon us. us. O Christ, Christ, have have mercy mercy upon us. us. O Spirit, Spirit, have have mercy mercy upon us. O God, the Father in heaven, we beseech you, hear us. O God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, we beseech you, hear us. O God, the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, We beseech you, hear us. Be gracious unto us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious unto us. Help us, good Lord. Be gracious unto us. Save us, good Lord. From our sin, from our errors, from all evil, good Lord, deliver us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon and of God's forgiveness. We will read this together. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Please remain standing as we sing Trinity Hymnal number 537. Take time to be holy.
to the book of Ephesians. You've got your Bible, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And what I'd like to do is uh, take the time to read verses 1 all the way through to chapter 5, verse 1. But then I'm going to focus on verses 17 to 24 this morning. So in order to understand the bigger context, I'd like to take time to read the whole scripture. And then um, we'll come back to verses 17 to 24. So please follow along, along in your copy of God's word. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one, with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be taught children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the, the, their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for how it reveals the Lord Jesus to us. And in this particular book, how it reveals the amazing grace that you have given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we pray you'd be with us as preacher and hearers. We pray that the Holy Spirit would open ears and eyes and hearts to receive the glorious gospel that is contained in the scriptures. And Lord, I pray that you would help me. We pray that the word would come not in the demonstration of persuasive words of human wisdom, 
but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power so that when people leave this place, their faith may rest in God and not in man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a little boy growing up in Scotland, my heroes were soccer players. and One of them was a man named, uh, a left winger named Willie Johnson. Now Johnson was a character both on and off the field. And he carried himself in a certain way. He pulled his shirt sleeves down and held them with his hands when he ran. And he blew out his cheeks when he was running along. And when, he, when I'd be kicking the ball around with my friends, well, I'd blow out my cheeks. And I would hold my shirt sleeves down like this, even though I wasn't doing that much. I was intentional, trying to carry myself just like the person that I looked up to. Do you have people that you look up to whose characteristics you seem to unconsciously have absorbed? Often that happens less intentionally, particularly if you're related to someone. You're tired of hearing it by now, but I have eight grandchildren. And a few of them are those that I refer to as mini-me because they're the doppelganger for their parents the shape of their head, the color of their hair, their facial expression, or the way that they walk away from you. And we say, oh my goodness, that's... And we name the parent. Just at Easter, during our family gathering, one of the children went upstairs and put on an identical outfit to to their father and walked around the living room and saying to all the relatives, I'm dad, I'm dad, trying to walk just like his dad. Very often you can tell who someone admires, who they aspire to be like, or who they are related to by who they imitate and how they walk. In Ephesians, Christians are called to imitate God in their walk because they have been recreated in His image in the man, Christ Jesus. Our chapel series has been focused on that question, what is man? And that appears to be the most pressing question of our day. You all know too well that the ideology and idol that anyone seeking to do ministry in this age must address and confront is that question. And answers have to be given to that most fundamental question in terms of human existence and the experience in relationship to God. And for biblical Christians, we're going to start with the fact that man, male and female, is the image bearer of God created by him to refract his glory in his creation. That's the impetus behind our series. And that's been the theme of our sermons. But for biblical Christians, the question cannot be merely theoretical or theological. And it cannot be merely addressed as an apologetic against the culture. We must be as earnest, perhaps even more so, in answering and applying the question, what is the new man whom we are called to be and we claim to be as Christians? And what does honoring God as the image of God, as the new man, look like? That's the question that Ephesians chapter 4 actually addresses. It's grounded in the indescribably glorious, redemptive, historical, cosmic work of God that has been revealed and accomplished in Christ. And those gracious realities have been disclosed to us in chapters 1 through 3. Perhaps you noticed the little summary statements as we made our way through that scripture reading. Chapter 4 verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling of with which you have been called. Chapter 4, verse 13, don't miss this. The end goal to which Christ has given pastor teachers to do their work with the Word is that the members of the church will attain to mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I have to just depend on your training at Westminster here and assert to you that that means that the God's goal for your life is that you would grow up into conformity to the last Adam the likeness of the man, Christ Jesus. Well, then down to verse 24, what the ESV has translated as the new self is better in context translated as put on the new man, created after the likeness of God, which leads to the conclusion of chapter 5, verse 1, 
the amazing conclusion. Be imitators of God in how we walk, particularly in how we walk in love. In this chapter, God is calling us to image Him by walking as a new man because we have been recreated in His image in the man, Christ Jesus. Or to put it all more simply, since you've been recreated in Christ, walk the walk that images God. But you know, and I know, that walking or living the lifestyle of our new identity in this age is not easy. It's a fight every day. So one of the ways that the apostles of Christ equip God's people for our walk is to remind us of the cosmic contrast between who we were and who we now are. And it's that little piece of equipping that for our new lifestyle that we have in verses 17 to 24, which is where our focus is this morning. And what we're going to see first is the apostle diagnosed the condition of all men outside of Christ. And then second, he's going to describe the conversion to the new man that occurred when we put on Christ. And by putting a microscope on those two observations, we will see that we have been recreated in Christ, so we must walk the walk that images God and not in the identity we once lived. We must walk the walk that images God and not the identity we once had. First of all, would you examine with me the condition of all men outside of Christ? Look at verses 17 to 19 again. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you, that you must no longer walk as, as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Gentiles are those who are outside of Israel, in this case now, the new Israel. To use the image of chapter 2, they are alienated from God, which here in verse 18 means they are alienated from the life of God, which means they are darkened and deadened in their relationship to God. In rebellion against Him, they suppress the knowledge of Him. This is a bit of a synopsis of what Paul has told us in Romans chapter 1 about those who are under the wrath of God. You remember? In unrighteousness, they suppress the truth that God has made plain about Himself in what He has made, not least in men and women who He made to be His image bearers. And so, because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, it tells us they have become futile in their thinking. And as you know, Romans chapter 1 descends through that descent under the wrath of God. As one preacher put it, as the truth is suppressed, the culture descends through irrationality into imbecility. Life reaches a dead end, emptiness, futility as to what God has made known about Himself, as what God has made known about Himself is continually suppressed, denied, and despised. Well, here in our text, Paul takes Romans 1 and puts it in a drop of ink. Outside of Christ, People are futile, they're darkened and ignorant in their minds with respect to God and His will. And that dark mind is related to and rooted in a dead heart. A term that is fairly new to me is the term Bible hands. Have you heard this term, Bible hands? It came to me from an associate pastor whose father was a sheet metal worker, and as he introduced himself to our congregation, he said, my dad's a sheet metal worker, and he's got these rough hands. He says, but I have Bible hands, because all I do is handle my Bible, soft hands. You know the difference between somebody who actually works with their hands for a living and somebody who's got Bible hands? When you shake their hand, and you can feel the calluses, you feel the hard skin, a carpenter, or somebody who's been, or a guitar player who's cal got calluses on their fingers so that they no longer feel the disturbance of those, those uh, strings as they make their way along. Their skin has become hard so that there's not pain. It does not penetrate. 
Verse 19 says that's where those who suppress the knowledge of God are. Their hearts have become calloused. But most tragically, it is to God that they have lost all responsiveness. They've lost all sensitivity. Their heart is hard, impenetrable, callous toward their Creator. And that's the tragic condition of every person who's alienated from God, who's outside of Christ. So my friends, if you want an analysis of the cultural context in which you do ministry, this is it. Wherever God sends you, wherever He places you, wherever your ministry is, what is most fundamental to the identity of every person that you attempt to evangelize or counsel or preach to, doesn't matter what their education is, their social status is, what their family of origin is, or what their country of origin is. Apart from Christ, they're darkened and they're dead. They're making no sense and they are insensible to God and His will. That's what's fundamental. But you notice it's not because they're dead to all desire. Desire actually, do you notice the text? It rules them. What they want is what they consume and what they can't get enough of. While they've lost all sensitivity to God, they are consumed with satisfying their their senses. Notice how the text puts it. Sensuality defines who they are And what they do. Look at the end of verse 19. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, you know that sensuality doesn't have to mean just sexuality, but a life where the passions rule. Whether it be a passion for power or wealth or a buzz or status, or success, or pleasure. See, it's easy to apply this to the high-def sensuality sins in our culture, but this also addresses every acceptable sensuality of decent people. For example, the all-consuming desire for applause can lead to manipulation and using other people. The desire for power will lead to bullying and the denigration and the abuse of other people. Passion for wealth and for comfort can lead to dishonesty, perhaps even fraud or theft. Every kind of impurity can be indulged by desire. And admittedly, while not everyone who is alienated from the life of God behaves equally as badly, this is the fundamental lifestyle that they all share. There's a walk that is shared by people who are alienated from the life of God. And it looks like this. I deny the true God who has revealed Himself, particularly in the way He has made me, and liberated from that knowledge of God, what I desire is what drives me, and it defines what I do and who I am. My friends, that's man, male and female, alienated from the life of God. If you want to answer the question, what is man, outside of Christ, there you have the Holy Spirit's diagnosis. And the culture in which you must do ministry, that desire-dominated identity has become exalted as essential to being human. The ideology of our age is if you desire it, you are it. And it must be affirmed in the unbridled pursuit of it. And as it did for the apostles, that should burden us deeply for our neighbors who are enslaved to a lie. But it should also give us confidence in the message the apostles preached. And the, and the means that they used. Because do you notice? The Holy Spirit has not been taken by surprise by the fundamental realities of your ministry context. He knows exactly who the people are to whom He's sending you. And He knows exactly what will work by the power of God to illumine darkness and to break through deadness and hardness. But don't miss Paul's pastoral point. 
Do you see that his point is not actually to confront the culture of the Gentiles? It's easy for us to do that with this kind of a passage, isn't it? And to be sure, that kind of critique and confrontation is implied. But, it, he, but the reason he's written the passage is actually to equip us. Those who have believed in Christ. Look at the beginning of verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. See, the point of the passage is to remind us that while we remain in the world and the embers of corruption remain in us, our lifestyle must not be characterized by ignorance of God and slavery to our senses. His concern is that we would not walk that way. A number of years ago when I was touring Israel with a group of older couples, we were introduced to an amazing man. His name was Mike. Mike made his way around the entire tour of Israel on a couple of walking sticks, and we realized partway through it's because he actually had an artificial leg. And what we learned was that Mike, in his early adult life, had been diagnosed with cancer. And through a through that condition, he'd had a number of treatments and a number of surgeries, and finally they had to not only remove his leg, but they had to reconstruct his leg and turn it around and actually turn his own knee into his foot. And It's, it's just this remarkable way that they put his leg back together. And Mike, in his early adult life, had to learn to walk all over again. It's kind of what the Apostle Paul is telling us here. We've been delivered from the condition we were in, but we have to learn to walk with the new identity. We have to learn to walk with our new legs. If you're in Christ, the diagnosis that we have just seen, please hear me carefully, the diagnosis we've just seen is who you were, not who you now are. And that change ought to show, uh, show up in how you live, how you walk. So secondly, in the time that's left to us, Let's consider the description. We've seen the diagnosis. Let's see the description of the conversion to the new man that occurred when we put on Christ. When we hear these, this call to walk, it's perhaps easy for us to look at the most scandalous behavior of the unbelieving world around us and say, well, I would never do something like that. But the temptation is, always remains for us to live a life given over to the rule of our senses. I remember the man in one congregation that I served that was always angry. He was just characterized as the angry man in the congregation. Every conversation, people are trying to get away from him. And godly and gifted people tried to counsel him. And finally, he just said, this, I can't control this. This is the desire that I have. This is what I have to do. While naming the name of Christ. Or there's the member of the congregation that I remember who was just an unrestrained and unrestrainable gossip and when confronted and counseled on it said, listen, this is who I am. I'm just going to be myself. As we fight the temptation, as we fight with temptation, we can let the desire for control lead us into a lifestyle of oppression and tension in relationships. We can let the desire for status and praise lead us into a lifestyle of manipulation and compromise. We can let our desire for warmth and intimacy lead us into immorality and unfaithfulness. As one author has helpfully pointed out, we always desire, and our desires always fight for control of our hearts. The Gentiles, we have learned, allow desires driven by ignorance of God to rule their lives. And we, in our former way of life, did the same. Here's the point of the passage. We must not walk that way now. Why? Well, because in Christ, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, in God's love, you have been chosen to be holy and blameless. We have been adopted as sons in the Son. We've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We've been forgiven our sins according to the lavish grace of God. And we've been given wisdom and insight in the knowledge of God and His will in Christ. And we've been given the Holy Spirit who not only seals us and guarantees us for glory, but He has, most pointedly for this text, created us in Christ Jesus for good works. 
See, Paul commands them not to walk the way they used to because of the conversion, because of the change he assumes has taken place. Look at verses 20 to 24. But that's not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about Him and were taught in Him as truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Stephen Baugh translates verse 21, For surely... You have heard about him. And for those of you who pay attention to such things, he argues persuasively that the infinitives in the text should be taken as indicatives, as indicating what happened when they learned Christ. Paul is not in doubt about the Ephesian status. He is taking for granted what is true of them in Christ and calling them to live in light of it. He's reminding them that in contrast to ignorance, they learned Christ, which means not just that they learned about Him intellectually, but that they have actually believed in Him. They've responded to Him. They have have embraced what was revealed about Him by embracing Him and being united to Him. And as they learned about Him, they turned and they put off not just the old self, as it's in the ESV, but the old man. In other words, Paul is referring to the definitive change that has taken place when they heard of Christ and believed in Christ and were joined to Christ. You know from the Scriptures and your studies here that the change that God works in us when He unites us to Christ has a definitive and a progressive aspect. We're called to progressively grow up into the image of Jesus. For example, Romans 13, 12 to 14 calls us as Christians to cast off the works of darkness, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provisions to gratify the flesh. Or Colossians 3, 5 to 12, we are called to put to death what is earthly on us and put on the characteristics of the elect in Christ. And before our text, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, we are called to walk in a new way. And beginning in verse 25, we're called to make changes to the way we talk and the way we walk in light of our calling. The New Testament is shot through with commands to mortify our old sinful tendencies and intentionally put on the likeness of Christ. But obedience to those commands to progressive sanctification are made possible because of the definitive change that God has already worked in us. The putting off of Colossians 3.12 is possible because in Colossians 3.1-3, you have been raised with Christ. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Romans 12.2 and 12.14 is possible because of Romans 6, 5, 6 one to five. Our old man is crucified with Christ, and we've been made alive with Christ, and sin no longer rules over us. If you want to go into the glories of those, the depths of that reality, read Professor Murray. But just hear Galatians 2.20, that popular pastoral verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the reality that roots Paul's call here. Listen, when we learned Christ, we put off that old dead man and were renewed in the spirit of our minds, no longer darkened, and we put on the new man. In other words, we don't need to walk and we should not walk as the Gentiles walk because God has worked a real change in us in Christ. Let me tell you how this works pastorally. I remember a number of years ago, a young man who had been raised in a Christian context and Christian Christian family back for generations. He walked like a Christian, talked like a Christian, even smelt like a Christian. And he got, he got himself trapped in one of those sins that young men get themselves trapped in, and he just, for whatever he did, he could not get himself out of it. And one day as we were in discipleship together, we were reading the Scriptures, and I got him to Romans chapter 6 about the definitive change that God has worked as we're united to Christ in His death and His resurrection. And as he read the Scriptures... He looked up from the page of the Bible and he said to me, you mean I don't have to live like this anymore? 
And it's not an exaggeration to say his life changed from that moment on. The reason we can walk differently and we must walk differently is because in Christ we put off the old man, put on the new man, don't miss it, which has been remade in the image of God in which we progressively grow more and more to look like our Creator. And if I could put it this way, that's the beauty, that's the glory of the Christian walk. See, we can, we can listen to the call to walk Christ-like in our world, and we can perhaps think that while that's our duty, it constrains us in ways that are quite unnatural, perhaps even inhumane. But exactly the opposite is true. To walk, as chapter 5, verse 1 will put it, as imitators of God, is to be truly human. To be who we were created to be and who we would have been had it not been for our disobedience in Adam. There's nothing, if you've heard nothing else, please hear this and answer to the question, what is man? There is nothing more authentically human Nothing more true to being man than to be righteous and holy like our Creator. And God could not call us to anything more true to who we are, what we've suppressed. He could not call us to anything more authentic, to be any more of our authentic selves than to be like Him. And in Christ... By His amazing grace, He has done precisely what we need to be what we're supposed to be. He has recreated us in His image in true righteousness and holiness. So if we could just go back to your ministry context for a moment. You really have the most wonderful message for people who are so darkened and who distorted about who they really are. God in Christ has done what they cannot do for themselves. He's begun a new creation in which they can be who they've been made to be in the image of God if only they will learn Christ. And in order for you to carry that wonderful message authentically, it has to shape your own walk. You need to walk. Not like the Gentiles, but like Jesus. The image of the invisible God, in whom the fullness of deity dwells, who gave himself up for you and now lives in you to form you from glory to glory into his image. Since you have been recreated in Christ, walk a walk that images God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for the glories of the gospel and how we struggle just to grasp the outlines of it. And the wonder of that gospel declaration that God the Son loved us and gave himself up for us so that by the Spirit Christ now lives in us, that the life we live, we no longer live, but Christ in us. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would not only edify us and encourage us in our walk, but we pray that you would equip us for our ministries to answer the all-important question about man in relationship to God. In Jesus' name. If you would, stand with us as we sing our final song today. We'll be singing Coram Deo, found in your handout. To understand quickly what this means, it literally means before God, or more literally, before the face of God, that we are singing today that we want to live before the face of our God. Let's sing together.
And you are dismissed. <laughs>